uh, banks, are, most of our customers are banks, and um, we've been doing this for over 15 years, and um, that's in summary what we do. Thank you, Mr. Deloga. Over to you, Mr. Blessing Ayenere. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Blessing Obehi Ayenere. I am the CEO of Umogini Pipeline Infrastructure Company Limited, based in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta part of Nigeria. What we do uh, is focused on the infrastructure uh, support to EMP company, exploration and producing company in the uh, upstream space of the oil and gas uh, industry. We support in the evacuation of um, hydrocarbon produced by various um, operators to the terminal where those um, crude oil are monetized. Um, that's what we do. I operate in the western part of the Niger Delta um, at the moment. It's a pleasure to be here and nice to um, meet everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Yemery. Um, over to you, Mr. Michael Hacking. You, you went off briefly. We're glad to have you back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the Can you hear me? Perfectly. We can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry, it, it seemed to cut off completely. I don't know where, where I got to, uh, but it, it cut off completely just then. Forgive me. Um, yes, I, I, I was saying that I was involved in business. I've been involved in business in Africa all my life and that I run a company which is very much focused on the African market. Um, it's in the fuels business. Uh, we import and export fuels into the countries uh, in Africa, um, and we deal with uh, the logistics and the distribution of products throughout various countries. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be on this panel with the, the rest of the team and to hear their views on how we can make Africa uh, one of the powerhouses of this world. Thank you very much, Michael. I, I, would, I would start off our questioning session um, with Mr. Blessing, I am Eric. Um, Infrastructure development is a key driver for progress across the continent and um, is a critical enabler for productivity and sustained economic growth. It contributes significantly to human development, poverty reduction, and um, the attainment of the MDGs. Now, you, you are in the infrastructure development space, um, most precisely in the oil and gas sector. Um, what are your thoughts concerning how Africa can position itself uh, to be, uh, you know, more infrastructurally stable. Um, we have so much deficits everywhere. Power demand um, will increase 93% between now and 2035. Household electrification rate stands at 43%, um, leaving over 600 million people without electricity. Two thirds of the population continue burning biomass um, for fuel, which poses health and environmental risks. So what are your thoughts concerning you know, what Africa needs to do uh, within, within that time frame? Thank you um, so much. Um, I think it's a common knowledge that um, Africa is the next hub of um, development um, when it comes to commerce and um, industrialization. I think the opportunities actually rest in Africa. And the truth is because we are behind uh, when it comes to um, infrastructural development as of today. There are so many things that um, we are still lagging behind. And if we can leapfrog in harnessing these opportunities, I'm sure we'll be able to bridge the gap and also reduce things like poverty. Now, speaking specifically to the areas where we have deficits, uh, infrastructure-wise, I think we talk about the issue of road, we talk about um, power, and of course, education. These are key areas. Um, we can expand that to healthcare. Now, no economy, no environment, we actually experience sustainable development when the educational sector is the way it is today. I will use the Nigerian case as a study. Um, other Africans have their own challenges, but in Nigeria, as a, as a specific case today, we have a lot to do when it comes to developing people in terms of academics. Now, the academics in terms of learning um, the routines of academics, and of course, in terms of skill development as well. 
we have huge poverty in the land, more than 40 million people to be um, conservative with the numbers are out of school today, young people, and they are unemployed. How do we expect to grow when we don't have industrialization? Industries are not springing up, investments are not coming. And why are industries not coming? Why are investments not coming also? And I think that takes us to the issue of policy, all right? Policy, we have to um, get to the point where we declare state of emergency when it comes to infrastructure. People can't invest when they are not sure of how they can take care of their health. People can invest when they are not sure of what the policy will be tomorrow. Inconsistency in policy is a big issue. So we need to address this issue holistically, not half a Sunday. We need to look at education. We look at power. We look at telecoms. You know, uh, for example, we are having this discussion and we are all battling with you know, stability of, of, of the network. That is a huge gap that we face. How can we compete, therefore, in the global market where we cannot have, you know, an opportunity to a seamless meeting, you know, and be able to have um, a good conversation? So I think um, as a nation and as a continent, we need to sit down very carefully. China have done this. India have done this. We saw what they did in the educational sector. A state of emergency declared in that area, and people have invested massively. They are not there, but we'll see that poverty is reducing and industrialization is coming up. I think, really, um, as leaders, we begin to have this conversation to push when it comes to infrastructure development and focusing on education, um, healthcare, and um, road as well. I, I will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayemeri. Um, Mr. Denuga, you, you, you have been very involved um, you know, in the infrastructure space, especially as I, for, from the information and technology perspective. What are your thoughts concerning you know, what we're talking about now? Um, you know, adding one or two things to what Mr. Ayemeri has just said. Um, I think um, just to add to what he said, I think having to have uh, the public sector invest more into um, infrastructure will go a long way, which of course will uh, include affordable internet for uh, the populace, I think uh, is quite key. And I also feel that the education, women empowerment will also go a long way uh, in helping um, the children coming up Looking at Africa as a whole and taking Nigeria as an example, um, it's a youthful population. Uh, and as such, if, uh, this, if there's human development, capital development, it will go a long way in also accelerating into a better future for, for Africa. Uh, increase in access in technology, like I mentioned, would uh, help in... Um, um, in the issue of um, having more uh, access to technology generally. Um, also, there will be better, um, I mean, looking at the support for technology businesses, uh, which of course would mean better policies, better uh, taxation around uh, businesses within Africa would help. And they're looking at venture capital from the public uh, sector uh, would also go a long way in helping fintech businesses uh, within the continent. So I think looking at those areas, really, it would. And then I, I, when we say human capital development, if we look at the issue of being highly, having highly skilled um, youth, we would have a situation where uh, other countries from other continents would come in and establish their companies here, maybe manufacturing, uh, outsource some of the um, you know, things that needs to be done to the continent. And of course, that would uh, promote uh, good inflow of foreign exchange into the continent. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you very much for your input. Michael, um, you have been involved in the fuels business in Africa for the past over 20 years now. And of course, you may have encountered some, some level of severe infrastructure challenges in conducting your business. Um, what, what would you want to add to what um, both panelists have just said? 
Yes, I think I think that the um, the answers to the questions set uh, by the organizers um, harasses uh, that the continent is poised to become the world's engine for growth and how to implement economic reforms and how to attract investment. These are really key uh, uh, questions. And I think our panelists have really dealt with a lot of the points there. But I think that maybe a debt uh, waiver would be uh, something which would be very interesting um, because since 2007, Africa has found itself in a rapidly spiraling debt crisis, um, essentially unable uh, to repay. And it, even when they took on the debt, uh, there was no chance of them repaying that debt. So it's, it's, it's really something that, that should be looked at very seriously. Um, and recently we've seen uh, French in Rwanda, for example, uh, are letting off uh, some, of the, some of the debts there, the Germans in Namibia uh, and the British as well in Kenya. Um, but these, and with some apologies for the colonial expropriation that took place at the time. But all this is just political platitudes, frankly, and doesn't go far enough to dealing with the problem of debt uh, in, in Africa today. It's enormous. And then I think even some of the, some of the points uh, rest amongst the Africans themselves. <clears throat> Repatriation of money by Africans uh, who hold an enormous amount of cash outside of, of, uh, of Africa. Um, it's estimated that something like 75% of the wealth of African multi-millionaires and billionaires is held offshore and that the continent is losing something like $14 billion of uncollected taxes, tax revenues, because of this, these funds which are outside the country. Uh, this should also be um, brought back into the country. Equally, the disparity of wealth between the rich and the poor. Uh, it's, it's an appalling statistic that there's something like, of the three richest men in Africa, they own more than 50% of the uh, of the wealth of Africa. And that means 50% of that 650 million people. So three versus 650 million people. These are statistics which are absolutely awful uh, and need to be addressed. Um, and then, and then uh, of course, I think another really important thing, which I think that some of the, my colleagues also touched on, uh, is the trade within their own borders. Um, you know, the, uh, Africa accounts for 2% of the world's global trade, but the intra-Africa trade is only about 16% of, of, of African GDP. Whereas in Europe, it's 75% of the GDP. So that means Europeans trade amongst themselves. Africans are essentially exploited uh, by the global system uh, internationally and by international organizations who come and take product uh, and mineral resources for very little. I think that there has to be a greater uh, attention to trading amongst themselves. And I know an association to be started uh, based in Ghana at the present time, that's the African Trading Association, which has been started, but there's a long way to go uh, to make that actually happen. But the final thing that I want to say just on this, and forgive me for taking up time, I see that Noel, we've lost him. I hope he's around somewhere. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the most important thing, uh, I believe, is education. Um, but I'll hand, the, I'll hand the, uh, the, 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 the baton to other people at this stage uh, before going to education. But education is absolutely critical. Um, and and our, I think the success and failure of Africa tomorrow it surrounds uh, education. Um, is Noel, are you with us? No. Well, let me just Likewise. let me just deal quickly with a couple of more points, and then maybe I'll hand over to you. To you. Um, but nearly 260 million African children are still out of school, um, and those are in the classrooms uh, are two to three years behind on syllabus. There's a lack of teachers and inadequate uh, teacher management and training. I gather that only something like one in four primary school teachers in Africa are trained. Um, you know, there's not enough focus on the marginalized and the vulnerable, the poor, the girls, children with disabilities. Uh, adult literacy is hindering schooling of children as well. And school 
completion is a challenge as well. Limited technical and vocational training. And then, of course, lastly, uh, once you've finished, for those who are lucky enough to finish, education into the job market is also a very, um, th there's not enough uh, assistance made to get people into that job market. And I've seen this on so many um, instances in, in Senegal, where I was involved in a company that was actually looking to take people from school into uh, the workforce. Um, and, and unfortunately, that business that was set up and I was involved in setting it up failed because there wasn't the support in the market. Um, Noel, do we have you back? Would somebody else like to say something? Because I don't want to dominate this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, session. Yeah, to, to add to what you said, I mean, not really, back. it's not bad. I, I'll just add to the fact that um, it would be good. Well, thank I, I you, think Michael. Will... Um, while it's not here, uh, maybe we'll call on uh, Mrs. Adenuga to um, yeah, come in at this time. Um, I don't okay. know what your next point is. Um, you want to share more light on this <laughs> as we go on. We seem to be having serious network issue here. Network today. problem. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? On. I can hear you very well. Yep. Yeah. I'd just like to add to what Michael has said. I mean, really, uh, I think um, it will probably go you know, a very long way if we can trade if Africans can trade among themselves. And of course, the issue now comes to the fact that, that we have border issues. Uh, within the borders, we have time, the challenges. On, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yep. Yes, I mean, the challenges, part of the challenges of these borders are the tariff, custom, taxes, and regulations. So we need to go past that to be able to trade amongst ourselves. And it will really go a long way if we could trade amongst ourselves. Uh, also, we need yeah, to madam, be... go ahead. I think uh, we can hear you. Um, you were making some, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think thinking. the other point I would Very like. Well. I can hear you. I'm sure Michael can hear you as well. Yes. Yeah. I think the other point that I would like to uh, mention is the issue of being self-sustaining uh, as a continent, uh, just like what is happening in China. Uh, looking forward to really when we get to that point, we're able to manufacture our own products and uh, also consume them at the same time, looking forward to when we have enough to export. Uh, I think also we can, uh, as a continent, eventually look at, I mean, when we deal with the issue of education, like I had been mentioned, having companies come in to set up uh, their own manufacturing companies here or even setting up companies, taking advantage of the cheap labor and the high population uh, really would have a long way in helping the continent. Um, thank you. I think that's my input. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Good. Go ahead if you... Hello? Testing, would you like to add something? Okay, okay, yes. Um, I think the reality is that um, the challenges we have in Africa is obvious and the leaders are beginning to pay attention to it. Um, the seriousness of that is what we want to see as we engage. Um, we have the AFTA, which is the um, Africa Continental Trade, um, agreement that is going on now, and we are hoping that the payment systems that are being also put in place, the PAPs, to ensure that there is a facilitation of um, um, trade between um, Africa countries is going to help to facilitate that. Like um, Michael said, and I think um, um, Shola also added, the issue of we trading um, or not trading with ourselves has been a big issue. There is that, there is that um, quest to want to trade with uh, the international market like Europe and America more than trading amongst ourselves. The question is, why has it been like that? I think it's because there have been institutional barriers that exist. 
Do we have system? Do we have institutions we can trust? All right. Do we have system that we can run our goods and services through? And we know that the quality of what we are producing or offering to the market is intact. Do we have payment systems where we don't need to go through the US dollar before we settle ourselves when we are trading between Nigeria and Ghana, between Ghana and, you know, and Kenya, you know, and I think those issues are being addressed. My quest today is that African leaders should pay attention to um, cross um, settlements, uh, border settlements, um, easing of transactions, ensuring that we remove and we debottleneck, you know, um, the challenges that we currently have as of today. I'm sure that will help us in accelerating into a more prosperous future. Brilliant. Um, we've got Ikem. Welcome, Ikem. It's nice to have you here, Professor Kumba. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm late. Uh, my, my clock, I, I, didn't, I didn't have it done correctly and I was sitting here. I'm sorry. I'm glad to join you guys. But, well, I think we just have a minute or so to go. Maybe you probably have something to, to say. Uh, certainly. Uh, um, uh, where, where do I start? I, I, I mean, I've met uh, Professor Blessing and Dave uh, and uh, Kathleen before. And uh, we, we've had this chat about accelerating African uh, development uh, quite a few times. And the issues that uh, I just heard uh, uh, Blessing and uh, talking about, those, those, those of uh, intra Africa trade as opposed to extra Africa trade. They occur in many uh, domains. I, I may add to it that uh, uh, the the colonial structures of the 60s are still very much in place. African countries uh, trade more with their colonial, uh, former colonial uh, uh, countries than than among themselves. The Francophonies, uh, we were students uh, and uh, international travel. Almost everything is tied structurally from from colonial um, uh, treaties and pacts. I mean, African railroads, infrastructure, they are tied to moving products to those colonial countries. It's, you know, and, and I share that uh, it's like decisions to repurpose it, to now direct things uh, um, uh, from one region to another region. The, the continent has uh, at least five regions according to the African Union. And so uh, and each region has a strategic source, an advantage, an, an assets that others do not have. From the Sahara down to the forest, down down to uh, Southern Africa. So, uh, if strategic assets can be harnessed to share among the continent, there was once uh, in the days of Chikanta, who mentioned that uh, the Congo alone can provide um, uh, energy for all of Africa. So there was there's no need doing all the other things when tapping energy out of the Congo alone can provide Africa. That's that's an asset that Congo can offer the rest of the continent. And uh, I've, of, I've often mentioned uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, labor force and, 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 and manpower. And our curriculum, there's a big movement to introduce, quote unquote, entrepreneurship education in our universities. Because again, for the last 70 years, our curricula has, has been about providing certification for graduates to have uh, public sector jobs. And uh, the little connect with, with industry, but then it, the big players. I understand there are at least 400 companies that gross one billion dollars on the on, on the continent. At least 400 that gross that much. But then the interaction between those companies and the, and the university system to provide to to align the training of the workforce to their industrial needs and plan and expansion. That link is. Uh, uh, be strengthened. After all, all what we're talking about will be done by human beings, by university graduates, and if they're not equipped appropriately, everything is conversation. Everything is, uh, we, we have policies, we have uh, visions, but no implementation. For the two reasons that, that I think is uh, human uh, human capital, human work uh, workforce, our university product, and what uh, Professor uh, Blessing was saying earlier, institutions. And I know that the African Development Bank is doing plenty of work in that area these days. Try to strengthen African institutions. All institutions across the board, including university institutions, that train the level force. 
if I, if I may just chime in that way, I, I'm, again, I didn't quite follow the, the, the inputs that I, I did have. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, please? Yes, um, uh, no, yeah, welcome back. <laughs> Logged me off. We, we, we lost you for some time. I have to reconnect with my phone. I have to quickly download the app and then reconnect again. Uh, yeah. Welcome, Kim. Nice to see you. I, I would like to just ask this question and pose it to Michael uh, because you are in the field space. And uh, it would be out of place for us not to discuss what is actually going on. The here. volume seems very low. Um, is that only with me or can we all hear him? Okay, can you hear me perfectly now? Yeah, well, it's faint, but it's okay. 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 Um, I, I, would want I, to, I heard, yeah. Yeah, I would want us to, you know, talk about the Russia-Ukraine war, um, its impact on the oil, on the price of oil right now across the globe, and um, how Africa stands to either benefit or get punished, you know, by this outcome. I, I'd like to understand what you think, Michael. What, 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 what are the, what, what, how should, how can Africa position itself? Um, effectively to understand what is going on and actually um, I, I, I don't want to say take advantage of what is going on but you know how should Africa be viewing this scenario right now hundred dollars per barrel oil yeah I think uh, that's a very interesting uh, question uh, no um, I think the impact the immediate impact by the way is is quite uh, quite severe. Uh, and the reason why I say that, it's not so much the price, it's who's trading. The Russia and the Russian companies have been very active in Africa. I think we know that. They've, they've, they've looked to come into Africa, and there's a, certain names I can't mention, won't mention right now, of, of companies that are actively involved in trading in Africa today and making supplies, whether it's supplies of fuel or for electricity, or supplies for gas or for, 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 for um, units, or whether it's gasoline for... Uh, for the um, for consumption cars, but these companies uh, are suffering enormously right now because they're being sanctioned right now, and so they're not going to be in a position to to fulfil their supply commitments into Africa, and I think uh, specifically in Nigeria, Ghana, and other places I'm thinking about where there are commitments uh, by these uh, Russian companies to supply, they will not be able to do so. And I do know that they are asking others to come in and supply on their behalf. So these are the immediate impacts that could happen. Uh, and I'm sure that the um, authorities in the various countries in Africa are thinking about that and saying, uh, is there going to be a shortage for whatever reason? The other good thing, of course, is that the oil price is so high, but it's not going to stay there. This is a, this is a temporary situation. And uh, my own view would be to, uh, to, to work through the, the stores, the stocks that you've got, rather than be forced to go and acquire these very high prices, because um, it, it's, it's uh, untenable and it's unforeseen. At the same time, of course, for those exporting countries that have got crude oil, of course, it's wonderful. Um, and, and, and so they're making a lot of money. And then it comes back to the collection of taxes to make sure that the taxes come in, that the money that they're making uh, is actually sufficiently large uh, to make a difference for the, uh, for the coffers of the state. But remember, countries like Nigeria export crude, but they import all their products. So there's a counterbalance. If the prices of gasoline and gas oil and fuel oil are going up, then you know, it's not necessarily a major difference for them. There's a cash flow difference, but in terms of the uh, um, outlay of cash uh, to buy the products, to sustain the demand in the various countries, that's difficult. So um, my, 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 my suggestion is that uh, the people look very clear, closely at the contracts and obligations that various companies have uh, said that they'll perform for the countries uh, and deal with that because that could have ramifications. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for your input. Uh, I want us to just quickly, um, you know, touch on this, and I'll start with Mr. Blessing. I know. Uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement presents a major opportunity for for African countries to bring 13 million people out of extreme poverty and, and raise the incomes of 68 million others who live on less than five dollars per day. Uh, it will create the largest free trade area in the world and um, with a value of 3.4 trillion US dollars. How do you think African countries can harness this huge opportunity? Uh, do, do you think we're on the right track or do you think it's just mere talk? Uh, 
Okay, I, I didn't quite get you clearly. I don't know whether you addressed that to me also, um, but I, I struggled to hear you. Did, did, did everybody hear me? Yeah, I did. Okay, you no, are really. Okay, I, no, I was talking about, I was talking, of, can you hear me clearly now? Yes. It's a bit better. better. Okay, I was talking about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the huge opportunity it presents for African countries, you know, to bring millions of people out of extreme poverty and um, raise the income of over 68 million people in Africa, you know, out of less than $5 a day. Uh, we, we all know that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will create the largest free trade area in the world uh, with a value of over 3.4 trillion US dollars. I was asking, how can Africa harness this opportunity? Do you think it's a mere political move or do you think African nations are actually serious about, about you know, taking advantage of this huge opportunity? Uh, Blessing, just, about, just two minutes, please. Okay, uh, I'll give you a quick shot. I think um, it's a fantastic move. However, it has both the political, and we are hoping and, and uh, believing that the sincerity of purpose in terms of um, ensuring that we have an inclusive leadership here takes the center stage. It's not for um, cheap political propaganda. The opportunity is huge. But for us to harness this opportunity, we must deal with the institutional gaps that exist. Otherwise, what we are going to have is we have a political move. And then we have Europe and the rest of the world benefiting from this trade. All right. Do we have institutions today that can guarantee the quality of what comes out from Africa? Do we have payment systems that will ensure that we are not dealing, Nigeria and Ghana is not trading and then we are going to America to settle the account before it comes back, all right? So there are things we need to deal with, and, and there are institutional gaps that, are, that exist. We must ensure that the institutions are built. We must ensure that we encourage the private sector to participate in this. We must ensure that the government face regulation and controls where they should be, and they are not taking the center stage when it comes to trade. We must ensure that the infrastructure that is needed to ensure that the trade is facilitated is also in place. Like what you spoke about in the issue of the crisis between Russia and Ukraine, the reason why Africa is not going to benefit so much is because of the infrastructure decay. We have gas in Nigeria, for example. This would have been the best time for Nigeria to step up in gas production we have ability to produce about between the sixth and eleventh producer, you know, in Africa. But we are not able to meet our OPEC quota. So we come back again to where we started from. The issue of declaring the state of emergency in the infrastructural space is now. And that is what everybody must agree to push forward. Thank you very much. Um... Mr. Adeno, do you want to chip in something, especially, you know, how we can leverage technology to take advantage of the vast opportunities of the, the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Well, like I said, I mean, if um, we need to start looking at the, um, the private, I mean, the public sector has to, that is the government, have to start looking into investing more into the infrastructure Um Without proper infrastructure, it's not possible to have um, the internet accessible to the general public. Uh, with that being done, it would definitely improve things. And um, with that also, um, we also need the public, I mean, the private sector to also come in to, to help in this uh, regard, uh, maybe in form of uh, venture capital if we need to look at um, improving technology um, in this uh, part of the world. Um, I, I think just like um, it's been mentioned, uh, we cannot overemphasize the issue of uh, infrastructure. I think starting from there would improve quite a number of things eventually, including education itself, because without infrastructure, the education cannot, um, cannot really work that much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Denuga. We, 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 we'll be running out of time soon. Uh, I want us to just take this last point, and I'll start with Nkem. Um, I, I, I will be looking at education now and, you know, the role of 
digitization in the educational space in Africa. Um, COVID-19 closed <laughs> almost every school in Africa, resetting education in the continent. Um, school closures widened existing educational, socioeconomic, and gender inequalities. Uh, with poor access to distance learning. Yeah, Noel, we are we are waiting for you to. Can you hear me? We're hearing. Okay, can, can, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay, so I, I was saying that with poor access to distance learning uh, resources, continents. Okay, it's like noise network hard. is um, frozen. I can hear you. In case you can hear me, right? What's the question, Noah? Yeah, what's the question? Okay. We've got two, we've got one minute. Yes. So, 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 yeah, so what I'm asking is, you know, how can we transform the educational sector in Africa, leveraging on digital com digital technologies, digitization? You know, what, what do you think? What, what's your idea? Well, my, 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 my idea uh, is that uh, uh, um, uh, the African continent should look out to its diaspora. The vast competencies that have the, the, the vast African population that has the competencies in the digital world, in the computer world, in the advanced technological world is mostly outside. And if they can be brought to come help on the continent, there are lots of paperwork, lots of visions and policies. Every country has agenda 2030, 2040. There's not much traction there. The human, the human capital to, to do that is, is less. The, the dependence upon uh, external uh, expatriate consultants who come and who come do quick one one year have a uh, two years short term tra tra transactions and leave without any uh, emotional attachment to the continent it's, it, it's been destroying us it's very true the the huge pivot that the continent needs to make was digital i mean and the continent is pretty much cut out from the rest of the world in terms of the digital infrastructures and the digital world that that's coming up everything now uh, the kind of uh, pivoting, I, I doubt the continent can do it at a grand at, at, at a grand level. The countries individually, like Ghana has tried to bring diaspora back and is and is upping their their, their their economy. The Nigerian diaspora is vast and extensive in in, in this area. They're off Wall Street to, to Silicon Valley, um, but then our universities there are struggling to have curriculum and how to, so reaching out to the diaspora and opening up. I think our political leaders have to uh, decouple from their mind. Diaspora as a political threat, and look at them as a human capital assets that can come and enable them to do what they want to do. They have the money, they have the interest, they have the competencies. There's no need to be keeping them out. But we know they're a double-sided sword. Our leaders are still concerned that when they come, they will perturbate the system politically, and, uh, and, 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 and they're not ready. But you see the countries that have been able to handle these, uh, these digital uh, uh, frontiers, China, Asia, it is their diaspora, not their homegrown um, uh, tra um, uh, uh, system. It is the diaspora. That is where the level falls. Is that's where the brains, the competencies, are well trained to, and they want, and they and they have the money, and they travel on their own to Africa all the time. Our leaders, our university yeah. system, not even, not even the ministers, universities can just open doors for them to come and participate. Yeah. Michael, Michael, you, you have invested over $12 million in the educational space, uh, you know, especially in Nigeria through your foundation. Uh, what are your thoughts concerning what Africa should be looking at based on your experience? <clears throat> um, in, in, indeed, we've, we, we are investing huge sums of money uh, in education in Africa at the present time, and specifically through the Tex Foundation uh, in Nigeria. Um, and, and uh, we're, we're focusing very much on literacy because we believe that literacy is the key. Um, it is a foundation. The room part. seems quiet. Is that it's, only from my end? Yes. I think it's only your end, Blessing. I, I think um, it's your end. I think it's your end. Okay. Go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, Michael. Well, go ahead, we, Michael. Are, we are waiting for you to... Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. To help us tidy up the session. Um, yeah, so we're, we're looking to deal um, with, with a, a comment that Dangoji made, which was that 9 out of 10 African children cannot read by the age of 10. I mean, this is an awful okay. statistic. Um, Inkem, can you hear Noel? Um, Mrs. Adenuga, can you hear Noel? No, my, Michael is talking. Michael, Michael is talking. can you hear Noel? Michael is talking, bless him. My, Michael is trying to talk. 
Um, so I can uh, hear him. African children cannot read. My network English. seems to be frozen from my end. Uh, our, our vision is that all children in Africa can read and write by the age of 10. We believe that literacy has the power to change lives. Being able to read enables children to realize their full protect, uh, potential as empowered individuals, engaged members of the community and citizens of the world. And we believe that the current educational models are not fit for purpose at the present time. We seek to reimagine education so it's in line with the requirements of the 21st century and a post-pandemic world. Uh, we think that we can do something for the children today so that they're not waiting till their 10th birthday to find out that they can't read or write, but to deal with it today. And that's our focus at the present time. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we'll be rounding up now, and um, we'll, we'll just take um, 30 seconds each to just give our closing remarks, and we'll bring this panel to a close. Um, I'll start with you, Mrs. Adenoga. Your closing remarks. Well, um, so much. It's a pity that the network is not working well, but I think the main thing um, being said um, by everyone that I think is quite uh, important um, two things. We need to be able to trade amongst ourselves as, uh, as a continent. Uh, that would help. And um, the issue of education um, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, we need better, highly skilled people. We should take advantage of uh, the youthful population in order to be able to get there, really. Um, that's a summary of what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dinka. Michael Hacking, your final words, just 10 seconds, please. Yeah, fine. Uh, I just want to promote, and uh, please look at the MC2H Foundation website. Um, but with such a, a, a young population um, in Africa, three out of five Africans are under 25. Now is the time to invest in education in order not to miss the current window of opportunity and ensure that demographic growth will not be a burden, but benefit. Thank you, Michael. And Kim, your final words. I share what the, the two, uh, my two uh, predecessors uh, said. I mean, it's, it's the same core theme here across the board. For Africa to do any of the things that it aspires to, it takes its own human capital, its own human beings, its own people trained. You don't focus on that. I mean, our leaders, uh, us here, looking at human capital, as the number one asset, uh, unless of uh, uh, underground resources, it takes human beings to do all these things, and we have to focus on what they get out of out of our, out of, uh, our educational systems. Elsewhere, where it's being done, is the human beings there who are doing it. In our in, in, on our continent, that's where the beginning. Is. That, that that's where I think we should start. Otherwise, we depend on the outside world at our own peril. Thank you very much, and Kim, Mr. Yemiri, your final comments, please. Okay, maybe from my end, I will say that indeed there is huge opportunity and potential in Africa. And Nigeria as a country has got a lot of opportunity and potential to offer to the international world. Um, we must be conscious about it. Um, every problem is an opportunity to actually expand. Let us leverage on the problems, convert them to opportunities. And then we all will be happy that we are making the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much to our distinguished panel. It has been fantastic talking to you. In spite of the challenges we've had with the network and the connectivity <laughs> and all of that, I'm sure um, Mr. Denoga can discuss with Horaces on how to help out in that area <laughs> of the technology space. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in future meetings. Um, have a fantastic day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Good to see you again. Yeah. By, e by email, I'll, I'll be in touch, uh, Mike. Thank you very much. All the Thank best you. to everybody. Uh, yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.